I'm excited. I'm excited because I love God's word. I love all of it, but I think I love the stories the best because I can relate to the story. So this has been a fun uh, series for me just because it's been all about stories in one way or another. So how about, do you ever have your feelings collide with your faith? Like, I feel like I want to do this, but, you know, I know that's what I'm not. You haven't? Matt just said you guys all had issues. So, so I believe him, all right? I, I didn't think so myself, but Max said it, so I believe it. So this is kind of about, we've been in a series called Wanted. Wanted. Wanted people of faith. Wanted people who believe that God is, wherever you're going, wherever you're headed, whatever's in front of you, that God is there already. He's there in front of you. Now that's hard because our feelings often come into conflict with that. And in our story today, we're going to see that feelings come in conflict with what God says they should do. So each of us face a crossroads in life where we say, I feel this, but God says this. But I feel this. Yeah, but God. And so we go back and forth. There's this pull inside of us. Do we follow God or do we follow our gut? And you're all going to say, follow God. Uh, but it, like many things, this is much easier to say than it is to do. And I think we'll see that in our story today. Hey, if you have your Bibles, our story is found in Numbers. It's like the fourth book in. Um, so if you want to find Numbers, we're going to start. I'm really going to be in chapter 13, but I want to just cover a few things uh, before that. Our story is... Uh, just when the, the uh, people of Israel are coming through the desert, they've left Egypt, <clears throat> God wants them to go in and take the promised land. God has promised them, I have a land in front of you, a land filled with milk and honey. You know it, you know it. I've got this wonderful thing in front of you, and now it's time for you to go in and possess, take, occupy the land. And so, <clears throat> but just before this particular part, we have the people in the desert. And I want to I back up to this part because I want you to see a pattern here. In chapter 11, the first verse says this. Now the people complained. They complained about their hardship, and they complained about it in the hearing of the Lord. And uh, so, and they started to say, if only we had meat to eat. If we only had this, it was so much better in Egypt. Oh, boy, I wish we could go back there where it was terrible and they beat us and we didn't really have any food. But they're wailing and complaining. And, and so there's this, there's this, Moses, Moses loses it. He says, Lord, why are these people, how long should I put up with them? And uh, he's, Moses says, put me to death right now. And God says, is my arm too short? And then we have a, a line I just want to say, because I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. In verse 28 of chapter 11, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been with Moses, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, stop them. And now this is talking about other people prophesying, and Moses says, no, no, it's okay, that's fine, no problem, you don't have to be jealous for me. Um, and then it says they... Uh, there they buried the people who craved other food. So there's this backdrop, and then right after that, in chapter 12, <clears throat> you have Miriam and Aaron who oppose Moses. Now, they're, they're like related, all right? They're, they're right in there, and now they're complaining. And now that brings us to the next chapter, which is where I want to st really start today, chapter 13, and this is what it says. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land. Send some men. Let's go explore. I want you to go check it out. Uh, see what it's about. <clears throat> so they choose 12 people. These people are called the 12 spies. Spies. This was a thing to do in those days. Well, it's still a thing to do. Don't we have drones and satellites today? We we have spies as well, but we have a different way of spying, but we still spy, and so do other people, so do other nations. But in those days, they didn't, you know, they didn't have drones then. They didn't have satellites then, so they actually had to send people. And so that was common 
to send people to spy out the land. So I want you to see if you recognize any of these names because they choose 12 people from each one from each of the 12 tribes. Uh, they choose one representative from each of the tribes. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read the names, not the tribe, if I can keep it straight here. Shama. Have you heard of Shama? J- just yell out when you hear when you know when you see here when you recognize. Uh, Shephet. Or Ch- Shephet, I should say. All right. Caleb. Igal. <laughs> you pronounce it how you want to. Hoshia. Palti. Oh, I got a half yes there, okay. Palti. Gadiel. Gadi. Not the Gadi, the gangster. This is another Gadi. Amiel, Sether, Nabi, Ghoul. That's a good October name, Ghoul. All right, so what do we have, one and a half there? Two. Okay. <clears throat> so we have most of these guys, I, I imagine, are meeting Moses for the very first time. Remember, there's over 600,000 men. That means you got women and children. you got over a million people that... Are in, and Moses doesn't know all of them. But they are picking somebody from their tribe currently who's going to be a great representative of their tribe. Here's our best guy. We're going to send him. So they pick out the 12 of the best. And remember, in those days, they didn't have pictures, couldn't take picture, couldn't take a picture. And so they these 12 guys have to go stand in front of Moses to receive their order, their orders. So they're there, and you can just imagine. What's he look like? What's he going to be like? What's he going to say? What's he sound like? This, remember who Moses is. He's the guy that stood up against Pharaoh. He's the guy that led the nation. And it said, let my people go. He brought the plagues. He parted the Red Sea. He led them into the desert. They, they were fed miraculously in the desert. And he is the leader. The, we got Ten Commandments, and we got... Um, the people making golden calves, and, and he's dealing with all this stuff. This, it's this Moses. He's both a great leader, he is strong, he makes good decisions most of the time, and he's not afraid to come against somebody who comes against him. Uh, think about the, the, the golden calf and the people that uh, didn't decide which side of that issue they were going to be on. <clears throat> so they are standing in front of this great leader and meeting him for the first time to get their orders, and so they are to go out and spy the land. But we have this little exchange, and I'm going to make up just a little dialogue here. I don't know how it went really. But one of the guys, Hoshea, stands in front of him. There's 12 of them, and he says, what's your name? Now, he knows what his name is because we just read he has seen him. He he was with him uh, uh, for a long time. He said, I'm Hoshea, and Hoshea means I'm salvation. Who are you? I'm salvation. And Moses says, no, Yahoshia, which means Yahweh is salvation. Why why do I pause here? I pause here because Joshua, Hoshia, that's why we had had the double. We weren't quite sure of that name, but we know Joshua. So let me back up. Two names that you recognize, Caleb and Joshua. But Joshua, the name is going to be important because as you lead the people, you need to remember you're not the salvation. God is salvation. God is the one that is the salvation. The minute you depend on yourself, you're going to be in trouble. Remember this. We're going to give you another name from this day forward. So they gave them their marching orders. And this, you know, this is pretty thorough, I think. Moses sent him to explore Canaan, and he said, go up through the Negev and up to the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good? Is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled? Are they fortified? What are we up against? How's the soil? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are the trees on it? uh, Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land because it was a season for ripe grapes. So they go up, and they do just what he says to do. So 
They have their assignment. They go out. They go to find out what they're facing. It seems like a good plan. Is anything wrong? Is there anything wrong with the plan? What was the plan to do? The plan was to look at the land and check it out, to survey it. Uh, much like we would send a satellite up or a drone up to survey a battlefield, uh, they are giving orders to go out and survey the land. Now, the decision should not have been, can we take the land or not? That was not the assignment. The assignment was to survey it and bring back a report. In Deuteronomy, it says, in Deuteronomy 121, <clears throat> see, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession of uh, it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear. How many times when God gives us a direction, direction do we fear? We all have, have done this, but God says, do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, let us stand, uh, send men before us that we may explore the land and bring us word again of the way in which we must go up in the cities into which we shall come. That's Moses telling the story uh, years later that the people wanted to explore the land. Uh, God understands our doubts, and this is an important point, I think. God understands our doubts. Somebody say amen. Um, but faith must be put in action. God understands our doubts. Do I step out? Oh, I can't see anything to hold me up there. God says to step out. Will I step out or not? Am I going to obey God's direction even when I don't see it as a great answer? And this is important when we look at these 12 spies because uh, some were willing and some were not. So, boy, now they come back from exploring the land, and this is the report. Uh, they come back, <coughs> and they come back carrying, you know, these grapes on, on poles, two guys, and this one cluster, big cluster. And one commentator that I read preparing for this said, uh, you can't imagine what good fertile soil can do in these lands uh, that, that what they can produce. And, of course, we're, we live around fertile soil here. We grow, I think, the best sweet corn anywhere right around here. It's fertile, good soil. But this was also good soil. <clears throat> so they come back, and they, they remember they had all those directions. They reported them the whole, they come and to the whole assembly. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey. And here's its fruit. Is that accurate? Yes. It's not a trick question. Would I trick you? And then there's this one word, but. You know, Jody, Jody will say this. If you say, yeah, I like you, but. That just takes away anything you said before. Uh, wh whatever you say after now becomes uh, a dominant, and whatever you said before pretty much doesn't matter. So that's what they do. Yeah, it flows with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. Fruit. fruit, fruit. <laughs> Can't say it. Here's the fruit. Here's the grapes. <laughs> but the people who live there are powerful. Is that accurate? The cities are fortified. Is that accurate? And very large. We saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live. Now, this is, we, we know of Goliath, right? There were a, a giant people. Mac is one of the descendants of uh, those people. I made that up, all right? I made it up. I'll tell you when I make stuff up. Everything else is, is true. Yeah. They're, they're, they're big. Is that accurate? We saw descendants there. And the, Canaanite, the Canaanites and near the sea along the Jordan, are, you know, this is pretty formidable. This is accurate. And Caleb stands up and he silences the people and he says, we should go up and take possession of the land. Why does he say this? Because that's what God's direction was. 
that's what God said to do, and he promised that they would win that battle. So uh, he's, Caleb stands up and silences. You, you remember Caleb later on. He was the one that there was this, this big thing later on when Joshua was in charge. And Caleb says, and he's like 80 years old, he goes, I can take that mountain. Just give it to me and my, we're, we'll go take it. And uh, he did. I mean, that's, that's the kind of guy he was. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Is that accurate or not? Well, it's half, um, I know know where you are here. I think it's halfway accurate. We can't attack the people. God said attack the people. Can we attack them? Are they stronger than we are? Yes. Are they stronger than God with us? No. No. See, there's important, there's important things in here. And here's what they did. They spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored and all the people that they saw there. They saw the Nephilim there. Now, they didn't see the Nephilim. That is not accurate. Now they're blowing the story up. The Nephilim, this is some strange thing I don't really understand, angels and men, and, 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 but they got destroyed in the flood. They are no longer here. And, but that, now they're blowing this thing up. You know, no, we can't go in. We're not going to go in. It's, it's this big, this big, and now we're going to make it bigger than it even is. And so they're stirring up the people. And now they, uh, they, they continue. Um, and all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And again, here's what they say. If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, we should choose another leader and go back to Egypt. Now they're really stirring everybody up. And Joshua and Caleb say, no, we can go in there. We can go get them. They, but they're outnumbered. The land is exceedingly good. Don't, don't be afraid. But the whole assembly talked about stoning Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, how long shall these people treat, not you, but how long shall these people treat me God, with contempt. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Wow. So, uh, this I found interesting, because we know that there's this judgment that nobody over uh, 20 years old is going to be able to go into the promised land. Because of this doubt. So there are consequences to that. Let me see if I can find it here. In the desert, your bodies will fall. No one will enter the land uh, except Caleb and Joshua. Uh, The men responsible. Somehow I've missed this in past readings. You ever read the Bible and you've read it through many, many times and then you come across something you go, I didn't remember that. You know, it's just like, oh, okay. The men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of the plague before the Lord. So there was a judgment to them specifically because they had stirred up uh, the people. And one of my favorite words, presumption. Well, now I'll just finish the story here. So... They realized that, they, the people realized that that was wrong what they had done. And now they say, well, we're going to go ahead and take the land. But God says, no, I didn't tell you to take it now. It's too late. Uh, you try to go now, you're going you're gonna to lose. this Because I'm not going to be with you if you do this now. Wow. How do you like the story so far? So, I'm going to give you, just as we conclude, we're going to conclude with communion, but I just have four quick things here that I I want to um, tag on here. How to ruin God's plan, all right? If you want to ruin God's plan, here's some things you can do. Just a reminder, why do we go back and read these stories? Because God doesn't change. His values don't change. I'm the same uh, yesterday, today, and forever. So God, circumstances change, cultures change, the way of doing things changes, 
but God doesn't change in his character. It stays the same. So how do we ruin God's plan? Number one, we ignore God's word and his promises. Just ignore his word. Remember, God is salvation. Your name is Joshua. Jehoshia. Your name is Joshua now, which means God is salvation. Um, you know, last, a couple of weeks ago, we said, uh, do not let your word or my word, God's word, depart from your mouth. Uh, don't turn to the right or left from that, but go according to what God says. There should be no disconnect between who we are on church days and who we are on, on weekdays. We should be the same, not different. Um, God works with doubts because we all have doubts. We all say, I can't see that. We all say, but, but he doesn't work so well when we refuse to do what he says to do. So we have to step out in faith. There's that word again, faith. You know, faith. We, um, when we were in our Bible study yesterday, our uh, prayer group yesterday, uh, what was it, Romans 5? Is that where you were? Romans 5. And it talked about uh, faith. There's just so much in the Bible about faith. Uh, lack of faith. So we have to step. It, what we do requires faith. If you say, I don't know, I can't see it, that's okay. But if we say, I can't see it, therefore I won't do it, that's not so good. That's where we get in trouble. The land's filled with giants. We're like grasshoppers before them. We're just little, we're getting squashed like bugs. Um, uh, and the spies didn't just say they were big. The spies said it was impossible. I know God said it, but that's impossible. Therefore, we're not going to do it, and we're going to tell everybody else not to do it. And that did not sit so well. Here's what it says in Exodus. It's why it's important to know God's promises. <clears throat> in Exodus 23, it says, I will send my terror before you. I will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. I'm going to back up on that a little bit because I want you to count the number of times that God says, I will. Not you will, I will. I'm the one going in front of you. Uh, I'm in verse 23, if you're trying to follow along here, the last part of it. I will wipe them out. I will take away sickness from among you. I will send terror ahead of you, ahead of you. God's ahead of us. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the, the Hivites. I will not drive them out in a single year, but I will drive them out. Little by little, I will drive them out before you. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines. I will hand over to you the people who live in the land. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Do we believe it when God says, I will? So, number one, if you want to ruin the plan for your life, ignore God's word and his promises. Well, how do I know God's word and his promises? You got to read it. <laughs> you got to read it. Four or more, that's what we, that's what we uh, said for about two years. You got to read your Bible at least four days. I say every day, but you got to read it at least uh, uh, four days a week for it to show any difference statistically in your life. I mean, by statistics. I know that God's word does not come back void, and there's that part, but statistically. So, ignore God's word and his promises. Number two... Focus on the size of your problem, not on God. So there's kind of a principle here. When we have our problem, you know, if you take something and, and you put it in front of you, you know, my Bible is a certain size, right? But if I go like this, my Bible's bigger. It's bigger than all of you. My Bible becomes bigger and you become smaller because I'm focused on it. If you focus on your problems, your problems are going to become bigger and God is going to become smaller. If you focus, the opposite is true. If you focus on God and his word, he will, be, he will become bigger in your life 
and your problems will become smaller. But Pastor Ray, you don't know my problems. I know, I don't. I only know the principles here, okay? I only know the principles. And the principles were, I will, I will, I will, I will. If your only means, all right, I'm going to preach here. If your only means of getting God's word is Sunday morning, you're in trouble. Okay? Uh, I, I don't mean that as a judgment. I don't mean that harshly. I, I, you know, I'm not doing this. I'm just saying it as a fact. If your only means is what whoever's standing up here and speaking or whoever leads worship, whatever's in the songs, whatever's in prayer, when Janice leads us in the beginning of the service, it's not, it's not going to be enough to get you through. Your problems will be bigger and your God will be smaller if that's all that you get. All the 12 spies saw the exact same thing. They all went into the same land. They all saw the same cities. They all saw the same people. They all saw the same goodness of the land. They all saw the same thing. But 10 of them came back with a bad report and two of them a good report. For 10 of them, the problems were here. And God's word was back here. But for two of them, God's word was here. And the problems before them were back here. So focus on the problems, not God. That's a good way to ruin God's plan for your life. And what was it Max said earlier? We all have issues. <laughs> we all have problems. All right? So, and I know some are... are, are in the natural, more severe than others. But the principle is the same. If we focus on the problem and not on God, God's plan doesn't get fulfilled in our life, at least not the ideal plan. Number three, fear is the source of much of our disobedience. Fear, being afraid. Oh, we're afraid of so many things. <clears throat> I think missing out is a big fear. I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. I'm afraid I'm going to... You know, it's going to go by me, and everybody else is going to have something that I'm not going to have. I'm afraid of missing out, afraid of things getting out of control, afraid of not being in control. All these things, afraid of uh, rejection, uh, fear that God won't take care of us, fear of missing out. Uh, fear is the root of much of our disobedience. Drill that down and say, well, why? why it, what is the reason that, that you know, you haven't obeyed in the past or maybe struggling with something today. Uh, fear is likely to be in there somewhere. Today, I think we consume fear at a higher rate maybe than ever before. At least it's at a high rate. Can we, can we agree at that? Oh, my goodness. You know, Vladimir Putin is, is puffing up. Puffed up Putin. Can I say that online? Uh, strike that from the tape. I don't know if I can say that. Don't get off your notes, Ray. <laughs> uh, there's so much. I mean, the economy, the, the prices, there's so much that we, could, we can be fearful of. Health issues, we can be fearful of. Um, but we can't allow that to cause us to disobey what God wants us to do. So I think today it's really at a high level. Matter of fact, as I think back, and I went through the gas uh, crisis of 74, uh, I remember that, and I remember other things that, that we've seen, 9-11, we didn't know what was going on for quite a while there, and there was fear, but I'll tell you what I remember, I remember hiding under my magical desk when I was in grade school, remember the magical desk that could protect you from nuclear, a nuclear attack, did you guys have a magical desk too, now I know how old you are. That, that struck a lot of fear. You know, when is the bomb going to come? But today we live in, in, in a fearful state. They wept aloud against Moses. They want to go back to Egypt. They, they thought it was so good there. They rebel against the leaders. The old leaders, Moses, he, he drops to his knee. Aaron, they drop to their knees and pray. 
The young guys, Joshua and Caleb, say, come on, let's go get them. Uh, but that doesn't work. They say, let's go get them. And the people say, yeah, we'll get them with stones. Uh, so it's all going sideways. They want to stone the leaders. Here's what happened. Our hearts often fail when things get hard. When things are going great, it's, oh, I'm blessed. Everything's good. God is good. And when things get hard, we can turn the other direction if, if um, we don't have faith eyes and if we don't understand his promises and his word. And here's a, kind of a, a, a thing about Moses' leadership. Even though the people rebelled the way he did, he still steps in for the people. That's a leader. Fourth, when we trust our feelings more than our faith, it was Adam, Adam and Eve's problem. They felt that they were going to lose out. They were missing out on something. And their faith in God and what he, that what he said was true, um, uh, that, that went by the wayside. Here's what uh, David Gusick said in his commentary. Unbelief often presents itself as being factual or practical or down to earth. Yet the most factual, practical, and down-to-earth thing we can do is to trust the word of the living God. Their unbelief was not according to the facts, but despite the facts. Factual or practical? Do you like factual? I do. Do you like practical? Pragmatism, do you like that? I do. I often look at that. Is this a practical thing to do? But faith eyes have to be in front of fact eyes. And uh, if it's not, we trust our feelings more than our faith, that is exactly what the 10 spies did. The report was spot on. Uh, they made the case for the facts. They embellished them a little. We're not ready to take the city. We're not warriors. We're not up for it. Uh, we saw them. They're much more than we are. Uh, and they masked their unbelief in worldly wisdom. We're going to have Paul Hoverson speak here in a little, a few weeks. I forget the date. But, you know, we, we, we prayed. They, they, with the Gideons, he's going to speak at representing the Gideons. But they, are, they go to high school campuses and they hand out testaments. Um, now, if you allowed feelings to be in charge there, you would say, oh, you know, the kids today don't want to hear this. Nobody's going to take it. They're going to laugh at us. They're You'd have all kind of things that would stand up against that. But faith, I say, we know that this makes a difference in people's lives, and so we're going to do it. I respect that. I respect that. Well, let's wrap it up here. making their story our story. Number one, our commitment to our faith must start long before the crowd and the culture get a vote. Um, if you wait to make important decisions until, you're, until it's right in front of you, uh, let's see if I can say this delicately. Don't wait till you're in the back seat of a car to make a decision on what right or wrong is. Uh, because that's a losing proposition. <laughs> All right? Feelings typically win. You, you have to make these decisions ahead of time. I'm going to follow God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I, you, you just go down the list. Uh, Christians are called to be different, and that's important. And you can't make key decisions under that kind of pressure. If you have an idea you know, on, on things like that, that you can make a decision ahead of time. It's much better. Nope, not me. And just the second thing, uh, we are on the road to rejection whenever we expect our faith to be easy. If you think it's going to be easy, talk to some of the older people here, <laughs> and they will tell you, it's not easy, but it's worth it. They will say, 
Nope, been some hard times, but I have more joy than you can ever imagine. Talk to some of the older people here. There's, there's value in what they have to say and what they tell you. Well, Jesus said when he was serving uh, what we call the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, or the Passover meal, he said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And, you know, there's, we remember what Jesus did, and that's an important thing. But I think for today, uh, I want us to remember, along with that, God's promises, some of God's promises. I want you to start looking for that. As you read your Bibles, start looking for promises. Look up online God's promises. Just read through the list. Because it's important to know them. If, we, if our God is going to be here and our problems are going to be out here somewhere in small, we have to know what those promises are. Now, if you'll take a communion cup, they're, they're in front of you, and um, I've got mine here in front of me. And if you want to... No matter what I do, this thing spits at me. Would you stand with me? What's the biggest obstacle you face? Or in Max's word, the biggest issue that you face. Um, I want to just lift that up to the Lord. And I want to read some of God's promises. Then we're going to receive this together. But I want you to let these words soak in. Make a difference. As only God's word can. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Fear not. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the New Testament, when it's talking about communion, it says to examine yourselves. Let's just do that for a moment. If there's anything you need to confess to the Lord, do it right now so that we drink 
as worthy as we can. Thank you, Lord. Turn your searchlight on. Thank you for these wonderful promises, and there are 7,000 of them or whatever. Thank you for them. Help us to know them. Help us to incorporate them into our lives. Thank you. Lord, if you find anything in us that needs, just bring it to our attention right now. We just confess to you what, what that is. Lord. Just do that right now. Just take a second. Thank you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus took the bread and he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Let's eat together. In like manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. Take and drink all of it. Lord, we thank you for your shed blood and broken body and for all that means for us. Thank you that you said who the sun sets free will be free indeed. Thank you that you said whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But I can't see it. I can't see it. It's not practical. Help us to believe even when, when it's, it seems impractical to us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your many promises. Help us to rehearse these in our minds through the week, to search them out, to co incorporate them into our lives. Thank you for your blessings. We love you, and we thank you that you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen.